18 months ago, I was uh, looking at spending 15 years in prison. I was addicted to shooting heroin. Um, I was jobless. I had been kicked out of the military. I've basically given up on life. And tomorrow, I'm about to attempt to run a 100-mile trail race here in Alabama. Uh, well, well, yeah, I mean, that? Sean, I think, well, I mean, his story is, I mean, it's phenomenal. Story, he's got yeah. a lot. That's a, this is a, a yeah. lot of layers to his story, including yeah. drug addiction and homelessness, jail, mm -hmm. PTSD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is addiction? It's a good question. <laughs> addiction, addiction is just the inability to the inability to stop an action even when you don't want to do it. And what is sobriety? To have power over the decision of whether whether I am or I am not going to do that thing that I couldn't stop before. The, the biggest the biggest blow was my, my squad leader. If I was going to explain to the audience or you, you know, what, what my opinion of what a, a true American soldier is, I would show you a picture of my, my squad leader, Sergeant Franklin. And <clears throat> so the next morning, we all, we all go to show up for formation. I show up, no Sergeant Franklin anywhere. And I would come to find out that he, my absolute best friend in the world, my best friend, Corey, who I had been in the army with the entire time. and. I think he had hung around me so much and I think he got so desensitized to watching me do it that uh, he decided to partake with some people. He didn't know that you're not supposed to mix opiates and Xanax and so he did. Felt tired, lay down to take a nap. He never woke up. And and so how do you deal with that now? You know, you're sober now. This might sound silly, but you know, well, it's, Corey's gone, and so like, how can I rationalize that? And so the only way I could was to believe Corey's up there looking down on me, and so every single action that I do, everything I do, I will do to my utmost best ability, and I will, I will make him proud. If he's down up there looking at me, he will look down on me on Earth and be proud of what I'm doing today. And one of the first questions was, are you currently suffering from mental health or addiction? And I said, no. You said, you're an addict, right? I was like, man, you asked me if I was currently suffering from mental health or addiction. I'm not currently suffering from anything. And I was like, man, look, I'm not going to give you the answer you want to this question because I've recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. I don't suffer from or I don't wake up wondering if I'm going to get high or drunk that day. So I'm not going to say that to you. Yeah, I think that's a myth that is often portrayed. And I think it's, it's disheartening to people who are trying to get sober. I think a lot of people's outlook isn't hopeful when you feel that I need to be tethered to this for the rest of my life. Anybody that's still in meetings that's 20, 30 years sober, and they have that messaging of like, oh, it's the daily grind. But it's like, if you're at 30 years, five years, 10 years, anything like that, and that's still the case for you, in my opinion, there's you're not doing something right. You missed the part where it's like, we do this to get back to living a life. The Patina Podcast is about the earned wisdom found in pain. It's about chasing failure, catching it, and using that as an opportunity. It's about scar tissue and sinew. It's about stretch marks and dented fenders and refusing to hide them. It's about pushing our insecurities and shame to the forefront instead of behind us. Instead of seeing rust as something that compromises a structure's integrity, we choose to see it as the grit that builds character. This is the Patina Podcast. All right, well, welcome to the Patina Podcast. This week, this, this is a third time's a charm situation, as we were just kind of joking about. We, we had one, one interview that just never really happened because of a late change situation. Then we had a second interview that did happen, full on interview. But the way it came through and the platform that, was it, that it was downloaded on was just awful. And so Sean's been uh, nice enough to come on and do this a third time. And, and get through this. So hopefully the internet connection is better and the download process is much better. Sean Livingston, he's a combat veteran. He's a ultra runner or has been in the past an ultra runner. He's the centerpiece of an amazing documentary called 100 Miles to Redemption. If you haven't seen that, you know, there's, where can they find it? I found it on YouTube. Anything, any other place they can find it? 
main, main place is, is on Amazon Prime. When it first came out, it cost I forget how much, but now it's now it's free to the public. So that's the that's the place you want to watch it without any commercials. It's on just about every other little not not Netflix, but just about every other little smaller streaming platform, YouTube and all those things. But obviously commercials are involved with those. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's an amazing documentary. It covers so much depth. Um, and so for the sake of me not doing any spoilers, I'm not going to mention too much that was brought up in the documentary. We will we'll go through some of your origin story, but um, I'm going to, I'm going to let the, let the viewer or the listener of this podcast see the documentary for themselves. It's incredibly inspiring. And also you're the host of the I am redemption podcast, which is blowing up and it's kind of, Again, continuing to be in this world of inspiring people, having amazing guests on there. I'm currently on, I'm into the Calvin Cater episode on, on your recent series that you did with the uh, New England cartel. So yeah, I mean, within the threads of things that we have in common that kind of, I think, I don't know how I stumbled upon you. I can't remember now, but I don't know if it's the al algorithm doing its thing for me, but yeah, you know, we're, we're both combat vets. We're both addicts. We both have done ultras and now we're both doing podcasts. Yours is far more successful than mine, but that's what we're doing. And so, yeah, there's some common threads there and some things that we'll kind of pull on within this interview and talk about, but yeah, Sean, thanks for coming on again, man. Dude, I didn't, I don't think even, even though we did our whole last episode and everything like that, I don't believe I ever knew that you were an addict too. I didn't realize we had so much. Oh yeah. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Yeah. 17 years now. So that's, that's where, you know, a lot of the, unfortunately the content, like there were some good, there were some nuggets, man, that you dropped in the, in the first time we recorded this. So no pressure, but you're going to have to redo that again. But nope. yeah, let's, before we get into the depths of addiction, I would like to kind of go into prior to addiction and the origin story. And yeah, let's just kind of get into that. Yeah. So grew up in was born in Alabama, <clears throat> excuse me, born in Alabama, didn't spend too much time there. Within no time, we were in uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio area, grew up predominantly in Youngstown, Ohio. My uh, stepfather was a steel worker. My mother was a teacher. <clears throat> excuse me. I did. I had a I had a pretty good upbringing. My, my real father left when I was two. My stepdad came into my life. I think I was probably nine or 10 years old or so. So very blessed that he came into my life and was kind of a a beacon of what a man should be in my life. It, it took me a long time to realize it, but yeah, so good upbringing, was into sports. Sports, I think, kept me on the straight and narrow for a long time. Growing up in Northeast Ohio, mainly, got recruited to play basketball at a school over in Pennsylvania, so went over there, and life was good when sports were a part of my life, but then I got in a, a nasty car accident my junior year, and was on my way to school. It was winter time, hit a patch of black ice. I wasn't wearing a seatbelt, went through the windshield, hit a tree, shattered my jaw on the left side, cracked my sternum, bruised both my lungs, damaged a nerve in my left eye, blew out my left eardrum, blew out my left knee, cracked my right kneecap in half. And so it was just, I was, basketball was over at that point in my life and everything. And so that's kind of, you know, very proud of the place I grew up, very proud of the family that, that raised me and everything, but I was just a victim of the circumstance. And so when I got in that accident, you know, my identity up to that point in life was a basketball player and I played basketball year round. I loved it. It was my passion. But when I lost that, you could definitely see the correlation of where my life kind of went left from that point on. And so I started hanging out with the party crowd and that's just what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Losing something like that my understanding is basketball wasn't like a hobby for you. It was, it, it was life. It was an identity. It was so much for you. And to be able to lose that, even because you can kind of see how the, how the map is being played out for you. You got another four years at least to play basketball ahead of you after high school. You kind of have this roadmap being laid out for you and then boom, the car accident happens. The only thing that is your fault is probably not wearing a seatbelt, <laughs> right? But but black eyes like that that happens. Yeah, you know? I could see how that takes you down a spiral psychologically to f it. Yeah, know? I didn't I didn't understand you know you know hindsight's twenty twenty, but you look back and and realize how 
how awesome it is for a young person to discover a passion in life. You know what I mean? We're, when we're young, we have no idea what we love, what we want to do in life, any of the big picture things. So just the fact I was able to discover basketball and it becomes such a passion was a special thing, but it was also, you know, a, a double blade, double sided blade, whatever that saying is double, double edged sword. Um, because when I lost it, then all of a sudden here I am this young person and I've lost my entire identity. And so I didn't know what to do, where to go, where I fit in. And so the, you know, drugs and alcohol ended up being what I found that made me feel like I belonged after that. You said your father left at two. Now I want to be a, a good therapist if I didn't hover over that point for a second. So you said your father left at two mm -hmm. and then you had a stepfather come in and model what it is to be a male and that sort of thing. But, but tell me about this time from the age of two to when, where you didn't have a father in the picture and the father that you knew was gone all of a sudden. Yeah, he moved. So I was in, I was in Youngstown, Ohio area. He moved back up to New York. I'd see him, you know, I think at that age, young, maybe a couple times a year. As I got older and got into sports, it became less and less, you know, maybe one time a year or that. But the, my like young childhood, my, my mother was going to school. So she was going to get her, um, you know, her different degrees. And so a lot of my childhoods was spent at babysitters playing outside. I guess I was like the last wave of latchkey kids where I was just outside and gone all the time, you know, riding our bikes, riding our, riding our bikes to, over to other towns. Some it's kind of a lost art. You don't see much nowadays. So I thought it was awesome, but you know, I didn't, didn't know the impact that it would have kind of not having that strong male figure in my life. And so started getting in trouble in school and you know nothing crazy but just all unneeded stuff and you know my mom my mother was too busy trying to like pave the way for us for her to really be able to I think maybe parent me at a level at which a father would and so and then there was that awkward time where my stepdad comes into my life and it wasn't you know we were cool but it wasn't like oh you're my dad now and so there was years and years there where where it was just kind of surface level stepson, stepfather relationship. It would take me to get older to realize the impact he actually had on my life. But, you know, there was a lot of years in there to answer your question. A lot of years there where I didn't have much, much looking after me or, you know, much accountability to be brought. I can only imagine how hard that is for your mom at that time, because she's trying to pursue things within her own purpose and, and passion and, and all of that, while also raising a young man that is, or a young child, male child, that's kind of, as the years start to go, getting more and more wild and, and doing more and more crazy things without the lack of... Um, accountability or male oversight to help kind of correct that right yeah for sure so i wonder how that how hard that was for her i can man it's i can remember more nights than i'd like to remember of my mom sitting i remember her she was going for a doctorate degree at ohio state and i can remember numerous nights of me laying in bed she'd come tuck me in and i'd be laying in bed i'd hear her sobbing out at her computer just because it was just at that time, even with my stepdad in the picture, he didn't live with us. So he lived back where we would eventually move back to. But while she was getting her doctorate degree, there were years there where it was just her and I. So me getting in trouble in school, me, her not having my real father there, her not actually having my stepfather in the household. And so I think she was just kind of, I mean, single mom, man. It's one of the hardest, most unforgiving jobs there is in this world. Yeah. Seeing it as a father with my wife, who's a stay at home mom, I can see the challenge that she has to do with like being a stay at home mom yeah. and being married to a supportive husband, or at least I'm going to give myself that tag. I'm, I support her, right. As a, a supportive husband and like how hard it is for her. I can't imagine the challenge of the, the single mom life, you know, like right. raising a child and, and, and having to take care of things financially. She's also going to school, all of these sorts of things. So yeah, that's a lot. The first time we talked, I remember you talking about how your stepfather played this amazing role, just in kind of seeing how somebody can grind day in and day out without complaining, doing a hard gig and just kind of making it happen. Yeah. I mean, I just, I can't still today. I like, I can't even fathom or believe, you know, what he did. Number one, being a, anybody that's a step parent or has a step parent, you know, completely thankless job. It, it takes, I think it takes, 
the kids to get to adulthood to look back and realize the the importance of that relationship they had with the step parent or anything. But that man worked steady, steady turns in a steel mill. You know, I don't anybody that's never been in or around a steel mill. It's pretty much hell on earth. It's, there's nothing glorious about steel workers, but they're the most some of the most proud blue collar people you ever meet in this world. And so day in and day out, he went in there and he would he would change every week. So it'd be day turn, afternoon turn, midnight turn, day turn, afternoon, night, afternoon turn, midnight mm-hmm. turn. And so just never a solid sleep schedule, just constantly, constantly changing. I can remember him working doubles. I can remember him working triples. Just they're not built like that anymore. You don't see people working like, I mean, I'm I'm sure there's out there, but it's not as common as it used to be. And so I never heard him complain. I never, I don't even remember him getting sick. He was just go, 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 go all the time. And so that right there is, you know, I love my father dear my 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 biological father he's also a very hard worker but he was a he was a partier much different than my different than my stepfather and so luckily I had two different types of you know men in my life that I could look up to when my when I was around my real father but my stepfather really is what what gave me the beacon on what a man should be you know just honest integrity character hard working and that right there is you know he's he was a godsend to me Yeah I I'm another one of those who are fortunate enough to have a really good stepfather and he, he exemplifies pretty much everything you just said about yours, Mm -hmm. hard work, not complaining, you know, doing crazy shifts going in. Like, so he's a, he's a, an apartment maintenance manager. I don't know what the job title is, but you know what that is, right? Like the, the apartment manager maintenance guy that comes in and he's been doing it forever and mm-hmm. he and he does it he 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 likes the work he likes the activity that, that he does with work he like the the people of the apartment complex love him that sort of thing but yeah like it's it is a job that's like it's a grind type job mm-hmm. and he's on call every weekend you know he's doing this stuff it's still like yeah he's he's that man just built different yeah you had mentioned this photo that kind of helps exemplify maybe the image of that type of person where you see the people on the steel structure being built and their feet, they're just having lunch, their feet are dangling over the edge of this massive skyscraper. I've seen that picture, I don't know, hundreds of times. I think that's a perfect, in in terms of a photo, a perfect analogy of what that type of mentality is like. And then I saw this a few weeks back, the photo of of the photographer that took that photo. Oh, really? I never saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool, man. So the photographer sitting there, no lines, nothing on a beam, just taking that snapshot. Right. I'm like, that dude's crazy too. That dude's like that, that whole era of, of, of worker is different. You know, it's just different because even the photographer is out there doing crazy stuff. You know, he did. He deserved to be in that picture just as much as those guys. I bet. Yeah. So Okay. So you got heavy into substance use. Um, and then at what point did you decide the military was going to be your route? So I didn't get, I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was, I'd started dabbling, you know, in Coke, smoking weed, drinking. It hadn't gotten bad. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say addiction. It hit me yet. I was kind of partying. Didn't start any hard drugs till I got out of school. Then, you know, ecstasy, acid shrooms all that kind of stuff was party once i got out of school then cocaine once i started doing cocaine i started doing it you know every pretty much every weekend so i was like i i tried one one glorious semester at college realized that quickly wasn't for me and so i needed needed to make a decision so i ended up 9 11 happened i was this is why i was doing my semester of school i was just walked out in the living room my stepdad showed me the tv and we sat there and watched all morning and so it was very shortly after that that i you know I wasn't going anywhere as far as school went. There wasn't anything in my area, you know, as far as opportunities. I knew I didn't want to go work in the steel mills. And so the military was the next logical step. And so I chose the Air Force. Ended up leaving and doing doing six years in the Air Force and got stationed over in Germany. Did not realize it was too young. Did not realize how good I had it. Didn't have enough life, life experience under my belt to realize how good the Air Force was, how good the living was. And so I thought I didn't like it. And so I ended up in Germany over for a while and I just had this image in my head that I was missing all these cool things back home and everybody's having so much fun without me. And 
I was completely delusional. And so I got out of the Air Force mm. after the six years, ended up back in Youngstown, Ohio. And pretty much as soon as I arrived, realized I'd made a grave mistake. Oxycontin had completely leveled the area. It was a, I mean, night and day difference from when I left. All my friends were strung out. And so I, I went back there and I didn't really have any any direction on what I was going to do. I just had this image. I was going to go back there. And because I had all this military experience, I'd get a good job and quickly realized that was not the case. And so went, of course, looked up on my old friends, saw what they were in up to and, you know, they had discovered Oxycontin. So I figured I'd give that a try like everybody else was. And pretty, pretty quickly it, it had gotten a hold of me where, you know, it starts off as a weekend thing and then maybe a weekend and a Wednesday thing. And before you know it, you're doing it every day. And, you know, I think I can remember the first time I, I thought I had a horrible case of food poisoning. I didn't know what was wrong with me. And then my buddy, buddy let me know. He goes, no, you're in, you're in withdrawal, bro. And so, so then it becomes, you know, you come from the addiction world, so, you know, and so it's now it's this thing where it's like, man, I, I've never felt this horrible in my life. You mean, all I got to do is put a little bit of that pill up my nose and it's going to go away. Cool. I'm in. And so it just mm -hmm. continued to perpetuate itself. And that lasted a couple of years to where, <clears throat> I don't mean to get too far ahead of myself, but once I wasn't in the Air Force anymore, I knew I knew I needed that structure back into my life. And so for the better part of two to three years, I was trying to get back in the Air Force. And so I started bouncing around. I ended up living in five states in two years, trying to run from my problems at each place. But every place mm -hmm. I every place I would end up, the problems would follow me right there because I was the problem. And so after after those couple of years, I tried and tried and tried to get back in the Air Force, couldn't do it. And so I came back home. I went to I went to my very first treatment center. I'd been in Miami, Florida for about a better part of a year. Couldn't find Oxycontin for whatever reason. So that's what I, that's what originally got me into heroin. And so I was completely strung out on heroin, had been so for over a year and made the first call home that I needed help, that I had a problem. I was completely asked out. I had no other options. And so I was too afraid to even call my mother. So I called my aunt and my had my aunt call my mom and tell her. And so it was the first and only time that my family would ever decide to agree to send me to treatment and they were going to pay for it. And so I ended up going to a, de a detox in Tampa, Florida. And so I'm sitting there in detox and I'm, I called home and we're trying to get a plan together where I was going to go to treatment. So my mom told me, all right, so go ahead and do your research wherever you want to go. Your grandmother and I are going to pay for pay for you to go. And so I was like, all right, cool. And so I, I was kicking dope. I was not doing any type of research. I wasn't going to lift a finger to do any of that. time. And so come to find out uh, a bunch of people there are going to this place in Louisiana. And so I was like, all right, I'll go there. Sounds good. My mind, you know, I don't even have to do any research. Boom. So I get shipped to Louisiana and a uh, huge huge house it's like a plantation house on all this land and so i show up there and you know everything seemed okay and all i noticed was like the first first couple of days every room in this house that i would go in had this picture of this guy up on the wall and i didn't know who the guy was and so finally after a couple of days i leaned over to one of the clients i was like hey who's this dude that's on the wall in every room we go into and he goes oh that's that's l ron hubbard and i was like who and he goes, that's L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology. And I was like, what is that? And so here I had ended up in Scientology rehab, had no idea what Scientology was or anything. And so one of the clients ended up, we snuck up to our room. And this was back in the day when they had portable DVD players. And so he busts out his portable DVD player and he pops in a South Park episode that ends up explaining to me what Scientology was. And I just remember being done. I'm like, where am I at? What am I doing? And so for for four and a half months, I was in Scientology rehab. And then, well, was it effective? Like, did they have a good treatment plan? Um, well, I relapsed the first night out, but I'm not going to put that on them. Maybe if I would actually listen to it, it might have helped. But at the end of the day, it didn't speak to me enough. So I did relapse the very first night out. And so I'm back in Ohio and I have no other options. And so the Air Force wasn't calling anymore or I you know, the Air Force wasn't taking me at the time. And so that's what ended up getting me to join the Army and almost sh shipped off for the Army, came to Texas almost immediately. And I remember they did like a refresher, refresher when I got into the Army. I didn't have to go through basic again, but I had to do like a, 
pass a PT test, get requalified on weapons, all that kind of stuff. And we were about two weeks into that, four weeks, and I ended up getting a phone call from the Air Force recruiter. And he said, hey, man, if you want to get in, just bring me your bring me your folder. I got you. And I just remember listening to that message like, you got to be kidding me. But I ended up ended up in the Army. Everything ended up how it should. And here we are. Yeah, you're like, man, I, I, the timing, <laughs> the timing. <laughs> now my life is side away to these people. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So what, what was your MOS? What was your job in the army? So the, the air force, I was a crew chief on C-130s and in the army, I just wanted to get in. So I was a, I was a fueler. Um, we didn't ever end up doing the job really, except when we were sitting in the motor pool. But when we went over, as soon as I got to, as soon as I got to Texas and Fort hood, we were preparing to deploy immediately. So we were doing securities on convoys, all that QRF, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so tell me about the story of like prior deployment and kind of what the experience was even yeah. and then eventually ending up deployed. So I get the Fort Hood. We're all set for deployment. We had some months there. We were going to be training, getting everything ready. And so uh, we were doing some, we were doing a drill one day, um, you know, we're, we're full battle rattle, which means we have on all our equipment, we have our weapons, everything. And so we're doing three to five second rushes. So basically we're in a big field and you're, you're simulating like the enemy shooting at you. So you drop down real fast, jump up as quick as you can run three to five seconds, drop back down again. And then you just keep doing it, keep doing it. And so I just come up one time and, and when I came up, I came up quick and kind of tweaked my back a little bit and I, I felt it, but didn't think nothing of it. And the day was over, went to bed that night, next morning comes up and, and I, when, when I, my eyes opened, I couldn't sit up out of bed. I couldn't roll. I was in excruciating pain. Come to find out I had herniated two discs that were now pinching my mm. sciatic nerve. And so I literally couldn't even step forward with my right leg. It, it was, it was hell. And so at the time, you know, unfortunately back then, this is probably 2000, 2008, 2009. Unfortunately, the education on the opioid opioid epidemic wasn't what it is today. And so their answer at that time was just a, a huge bottle of painkillers and hit me up with a couple of steroid shots and sent me on my way. And so the the unfortunate thing about the you know the military, you know, at the time my unit, I'm not saying the military as a whole, but it was just the culture was we're getting ready to de to deploy. And if I'm not serviceable, if I'm not ready to deploy. I'm kind of worthless to them. And, you know, you, you get that feeling pretty quick. It doesn't matter friends or not, you know, when you realize when you join the military, you're government property. And so there were a lot of people that started looking at me kind of crazy. Like I was, you know, purposely getting, you know, faking an injury to not deploy. And that's, that's just not me. And so I did, I was going to do whatever I had to do by any means necessary to make sure I deployed and, you know, went over there. And so I did and I got deployed. That was probably the worst thing for me because now it's day in, day out. You're in your, you're in your gear every day, jumping up and down off Humvees and, and MRAPs and different trucks. And it was just, just beat my back down, you know, day in and day out. And so when it was all said and done, we were in Iraq. And at one point, I think we were about seven, eight months into the deployment. I got sent over to um, the green zone so I could get some steroid shots in my back. And Long story short, I ended up getting Camp Taji, which is the biggest military installation um, in Iraq. I got that entire installation shut down on painkillers. Not one soldier could get any painkillers because of me. So that was uh, that was my claim to fame in Iraq right there. Yeah, you probably saved some people right there. <laughs> but, but no, thank, thank God I didn't kill anybody, though. Might have been might have been the uh, first people you saved in addiction uh, prior to you ever being in recovery. <laughs> right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember you mentioning that. And I, I mentioned when we first spoke, you know, like for us, man, I. There's no way I like I couldn't get my hands on on pain medication. This was between 02 and 05. But yeah, like, the you know, it was it was always Motrin, this huge, giant pill of Motrin, yep, yep, yep. big old pill of Motrin is drink water, take Motrin, drink water, take Motrin and be like, my knees hurt, drink water, take Motrin. I, I have shin splints, drink water, take Motrin, Wh whatever it is, whatever the thing is. Right. So yeah, I, at the time I was like, you know, this sucks. They don't, they're not really treating you for whatever, you know, they don't take your injury seriously or whatever. But now looking back on it and hearing your story, I'm like, 
yeah, thank God they didn't put me on, you know, on whatever opiate they had lying around, you know? Dude, I, so, yeah. That surprises me. I can remember literally within my first couple of weeks of being a, being where I was stationed, going to sick call and just saying just a generic injury. It was, I was like, my knee hurt. And they gave me Vicodin like that. So it surprises me that this was all happening after you had that experience. Don't get me wrong. There is the water and Motrin for everything else, but I didn't find it too hard. I didn't find it too hard to ever get pain medication. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's certain units or, you know, obviously you have different doctors for each unit and what, you know, the medical team and and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I know I was talking with an army buddy a few nights ago who had, who I hadn't talked to in a while and, we both basically came to the synopsis that our unit just sucked. Our unit, our unit that it, it was a, it was not like, like there, somebody asked me, you know, did you love it or you, did you hate it in the military? I'm like both, you know, there are a lot of things I, I despised about, it, especially first getting there initially. It, it took way too much to earn respect there from other people. Like you go in there, I think like, you're 1920 and you got 1920 year olds yelling at you like they're drill sergeants yep. for in, in, in my unit and I was infantry. Right. So there's a certain ego and, and thing along with that. But yeah, so it was just like, you know, the beginning of it, I hated it, but anyway, not to get too far off on a tangent with that, but, but yeah, our unit in terms of how it treated people like people with back injuries and, and things like that. I remember we, we had a guy named Ventures who was there and yeah, he, he had a back injury and same thing. Now, you know, Motrin water, Motrin water, you know, sort of thing. But, and he ended up getting out on a medical because of the back. So anyway, but yeah, interesting just how different units ran things, but not to say that alcohol wasn't flowing like, like it was water, you know, <laughs> in our unit. Sure. So, so yeah. So due to the back injury, you, you're, you're continuing to bear through it, but you're bearing through it while taking medication. You're deployed. How long was your deployment? A year. And then when you got back, how, how long was it before there was a downfall for you or, you know, how, how long did that take? I mean, I would say the beginning of the downfall was as soon as we got back because now we've now we're deployed. I saved up, you know, saved up all that money from being deployed. Mm-hmm. There was also there was also means to make extra money over there. And so I definitely did that. Mm-hmm. So I came back balling, what I thought was balling. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, but then you go on leave and, and everything. And so my it wasn't an immediate downfall, but it was definitely progressive. I was able to just kind of you know what it's like going from deployment. You come back and things are just chill for a long time. When you get back, you know, you show up to the motor pool, they send you home. And so it was easy to mm-hmm. stay, stay hidden for a long time. And then I was a master shammer at this point. So I could always kind of bob, bob in and out, make my face be seen and then get back out of there. But I would say overall for the unit, man, when, when we got back, the wheels kind of started falling off for everybody. And so I come back and you know, I blow through my money pretty quick. Now I'm, now I'm like deep into addiction and things just started falling apart around me. All the people that I was closest to, everything started falling apart. And so within the first couple of months of getting back, the, the biggest, the biggest blow was my, my squad leader. If I was going to explain to the audience or you, well, you know, what, what my opinion of what a, a true American soldier is, I would show you a picture of my, my squad leader sergeant franklin he was just everything you wanted to be in a soldier everything you wanted to be in a leader somebody i looked up to a great deal and <clears throat> so we come back and he was a big patriots fan i'm a big steelers fan and so it just so happened the patriots and steelers were getting ready to play you know big rivalry and so we were messaging you know all evening back and forth and we're talking smack and so the next morning we all we all go to show up for formation. I show up. There's no Sergeant Franklin anywhere. And I would come to find out that he had actually, he'd emptied a clip out on his wife and uh, then turned the gun on himself, took his own life. I guess they had found out about some adultery, why, why he was gone. And I think alcohol and maybe some pills were involved in everything. And I think, I don't know for sure, but that was a huge blow to me. Uh, I looked up to this dude more than anything and I need everybody to understand how completely uncharacteristic this is for this man. This is, I would have trusted this man with my life. This is not something, a heinous, 
heinous act like that, I would never expect. And so that happened. My absolute best friend in the world. If anybody ever watched the documentary, we talk about it quite a bit. But my best friend, Corey, who I had been in the army with the entire time, he was part of another unit, but we were still hung out every day. And I think he had hung around me so much and saw me get into hard drugs and use every day and still be able to kind of, you know, sneak my way in the military and not exactly get caught for a long time. I think he became desensitized to it. And so he ended up getting, he ended up getting shipped off to another duty station. And when he did, he was never a partier like I was, he did not do hard drugs, but I think he got so desensitized to watching me do it that he decided to partake with some people. Nobody told him or he didn't know that you're not supposed to mix opiates and Xanax. And so he did felt tired, lay down to take a nap. He never woke up. And so now I have my squad leader, my best friend's gone. And my other, one of my other best friends, he went home on leave when we came home from Iraq and they found him laying unresponsive in his kitchen. It was laying next to his mother who was dead from blunt force trauma to the head. He, he had mixed alcohol and pills and apparently had accidentally killed his mother and woke up, had no idea. And so he's, he's doing life in prison in Alabama right now. And so these are three like people that I love dearly that were huge in my life that are now, you know, now essentially gone out of it. And then here's me with this crippling opiate addiction. And so it wasn't, it wasn't good. And so with, I'd say within probably within that first year of being back was the, was the beginning of the end. And then that it was a whole last year of them ch chaptering me out, me failing your analysis tests and, you know, the ball rolls slow in the military. So at the end of my four years, I ended up getting kicked out. And I think in the very ending process of me being kicked out, I just went AWOL and never went back. So that, that's a lot, Sean. Do you feel like those, those deaths or those situations with those three individuals, do you think it played a role or do you think you were already off and running so much that those were, those were just traumas that were by proxy within you know your story i was i was definitely going to get high regardless but i think that definitely put a you know kind of put a battery in my back and caused it to go even even harder i just didn't want to feel anything and so that's you know that was my answer to not feel or to ever process or you know ever actually stand in front of these things that happen and deal with them and so i just chose to you know, put them off to the side and, you know, shed a tear here or there. But, you know, I ended up drowning, drowning my sorrows in drugs and alcohol just so I didn't have to feel anything. Mm -hmm. And and so how do you deal with that now? You know, you're sober now. I don't want to cut too far forward, but how do you deal with those losses now? This might sound silly, but, you know, well, this might sound silly, but the the one that hits me the hardest is my my best friend, Corey, who, who OD'd because I feel like he was the innocent one of the three. And, you know, ultimately I didn't give him the drugs that took his life. I didn't, you know, tell him to do it or anything like that, but I do feel that I am, I do have responsibility in that. And so we'll get into this later, I'm sure, but there, there's a point after me getting out of the military that I ended up in prison pretty quick. And so I remember laying there and trying to rationalize kind of his his death in my head. And I came to a, you know, a lot of people that get locked up. You, you have a lot of time on your hands. You turn to the Bible. A lot of people get very religious when they're inside. And so, you know, I had started praying a lot and was reading the Bible. And, you know, I ended up reading the book Purpose Driven Life. And that was a that was a big help to me. And I started thinking about kind of my purpose overall. And I started thinking about like, for me to think that my purpose on earth is just, to, it's all sunshine and rainbows and I'm just supposed to be happy all the time. That's silly. And so mm -hmm. like, I, I really had to ask myself, do I believe in God? And the answer is yes. You know, do I believe God has a purpose for me? Yes, I do. And so what is that purpose? And so I just started thinking about my whole, my whole journey. And I thought about my boy Corey a lot. And I thought about my brothers and sisters a lot because I realized how bad I had let them all down. And so I kind of came to terms with if this is supposed to be my journey, if my journey was to, you know, I, I ascended pretty high as an athlete growing up in high school and was definitely a, a bro an older brother that my brothers and sisters could look up to. And the funny thing about Corey and I is from as soon as we got tight, I always referred to him as my little brother. He, he always in, uh, referred to me as big bro. 
that's literally we didn't call each other by our names it was you know little bro big bro all that and so I kind of came to terms with it. this was supposed to be my purpose and I was supposed to end up here as a cautionary tale to my brothers and sisters on what not to do then it was all worth it and I'd do it again but Corey's gone and so like how could I rationalize that and so the only way I could was to believe like I believe in God I believe I do believe Corey's up there looking down on me and so I thought of the idea when I was in prison. I didn't actually apply it until I got sober and got my life together. But I made for damn sure that if Corey's looking down on me, that he every single action that I do, everything I do, I will do to my utmost best ability. And I will I will make him proud. If he's down up there looking at me, he will look down on me on earth and be proud of what I'm doing today. Hmm. So let's let's kind of skip forward then because it, you're already naturally taking us there within the story. So you get out, you quickly get into trouble. Like you said, you end up in jail. You have this, this realization there because you have time where you're actually sober to sit and what else are you going to do with your time? So you invest and you start investing into some spirituality. You have this kind of, like you just mentioned that realization with Corey and how to honor him by being the best version of yourself possible and getting sober. Mm -hmm. So what was the process for you to get sober from there, from that time where you're in, in jail to getting sober? Right. So I get out, I get out of prison in Texas. I ended up in, I ended up in Austin. No, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I was under the impression when you get when you're out of the military, life is over. If you've been kicked out of the military, there's nothing out there for you. And so I still had that mindset. And so I got into prison and I walked around with this, you know, basically with this self-induced stigma that everybody knew that I'd been kicked out of the military, that everybody knew that I was a felon now, that I'd been to prison, which it wasn't real. And so I don't I didn't stay straight for too long. You know, you get out and you know, I, I wanted, I wanted to be accepted. I wanted love. I was in a, I was in a pretty toxic relationship before I'd left the prison, jumped back into that relationship as soon as I got out. So it was not going anywhere good. I originally went to prison for two, two different, two separate charges of possession of heroin. And so do my time on that, get out. And then, you know, pretty, pretty quick after that, I ended up catching two more felonies for possession for heroin. And so it was just, in and out of jail, talk, toxic relationship. There was nothing of note, just, you know, basically held up in an apartment. And the only time I'd leave is to, to go get high, to go get drugs, to come back and get high. And so I ended up catching that fourth felony and <clears throat> stood in front of a, you know, I tell people all the time, I used to, I used to run around the streets and think, think I was this real big, tough guy, just military service, fighting, you name it, was, was always down for whatever. And I uh, thought I was just this badass and this tough guy. And so I stood in front of a judge and that judge looked me dead in the face and told me he was going to charge me as a habitual criminal that he didn't see, see any reason to sentence me to under 20 years. And that right there is one of the most defining moments of my life because it, excuse my language, but it scared the shit out of me. All the tough guy stuff went right out of the window. I was afraid. I did not want to go back. I had already... I wanted to change. I wanted to change my life. I didn't want to be the tough guy anymore. I, w I wanted to actually try to get sober. I remember my whole time in prison before just kind of looking around all the time. And I was like, I'm, you know, I'm not like this. Like I wasn't raised like this. I'm not like a lot of these people. Granted, I, you know, I did, I did wrong, but I, I had a, I had a substance abuse issue, abuse issue. I wasn't stealing from people. I didn't rob anybody. I wasn't murdering people, rape, none of that. So I just, I didn't want to go back. I wanted to know why I was the way I was. And so the lawyer I had at the time, I just asked him, like, do you think before we have my sentencing date that I'd, I could maybe get some help? And he goes, as long as you're in treatment, we won't have your sentencing date. So you go do what you got to do. And so I left. I ended up checking in, checking into the VA in Temple, Texas. I did eight months in something called the domiciliary, where it's basically you live on the ground. You live in the building. You do classes each day. You can have a job, all these things, just kind of a place to get on your feet. And mm -hmm. so I had also gotten into the... 12 step program started going to AA. Uh, a lot of people had started hearing about my story and rallying around me. And so that was kind of the first time I had 
Now I had found, discovered a little bit of a community and all that. And so did my eight months at the VA. And then all of a sudden it came time for me to do, to start talking about my sentencing hearing. And for whatever reason, throughout this whole eight months at the VA, I, I'm, let me preface this, this, preface this with, I'm not a super organized person, but for whatever reason, I had decided to keep a folder of all the work I'd been doing in the VA for that eight months. And so every note I took, every worksheet I filled out, every test we took, any of that type of stuff I saved and just threw in this folder. And then every meeting I went to with AAA, I would, I would get something signed on my own. Nobody told me to do it. I didn't know why I was doing it. I just wanted to show what I had been doing. And as my day, court day got closer and closer, a lot of the people that had rallied around me started bringing me character letters of the way I've been showing up in the community and all that. And so I went with a pretty fat folder to my lawyer and I slid him that folder and he took it and opened it up. And I just remember him looking up, looking up at me and his jaw dropped. And he's like, Sean, I've never expected this out of you. Like you've really given me something to work with. And so whatever you're doing, I need you to keep doing it. Let me go back and talk to the judge. And so again, another super important defining moment in my life to where that was like the first time in as long as I can remember that I had felt hope. And so I was like, all right, I don't know what's going to happen. And so I tried to go back to the VA and they actually turned me away. They said I had done too much time there. I got to figure out something, mm -hmm. figure something else out. And so there was a state funded, state funded treatment center in Austin, Texas. And I called them. They told me it was a six month inpatient commitment. And I said, let's go, I'll do it. And so I checked into that treatment center and I never really looked back. That was what that was what kind of solidified me in Texas, what got me in Austin. And I don't want to go too far past that, but that, that's what the, that's what that time period in between that looked like. What what was the what was the ruling then? Did the judge, you know, the judge obviously pulled back on the 20 year sentence. Yep. And then what did the ruling end up being? he gave me max probation, which was 10 years, 10 years probation. And so I remember the first time I went to prison, probation was an offer they had given me and I had turned it down because I had heard from everybody. If you don't think you can complete probation, don't do it. Just take your time or else. Cause if you end up messing up on probation, they're going to send you anyways. And so I did that. And mm. then this time I had some sobriety time up under my belt. I was all in on it. And so we were, once they, they had the folder and everything, he offered me max probation. And I just, I didn't even think about it. I said, I'll take it. And that was like all the opportunities I've gotten in life, all the times I'd gotten out of trouble. There was never any, it was always like, ah, got him again, got him again. And it was like the means to be able to keep going. And that was the one time it sank in where it was like, oh, this is my last shot. If, you know, they're talking about sending me for 20 years. If I get in trouble again, then what are they talking about? You know what I mean? You might as well be a life sentence. And so I was completely all in. I went back to that six month treatment center and just, you know, it, it, it began to transform who I was. Mm -hmm. And so then, yeah, you, you go to Austin, you go to a program, you do what many people do when they're programming a residential, they start putting on some weight and in ways that they don't want to put on weight. <laughs> so you decide to do something about it. Yeah. You decide to go and go and, uh, you know, take on a running club and impress everybody with your running skills. I think you were still smoking at the time too. So yeah, you want to talk about that process? Yeah. So just through, through my injury, through addiction, I'd put on a bunch of weight. I was like 260. I had a huge, huge gut and just, I'd always grown up, grown up an athlete, was always great at sports. And so now I'm finding this, finding this time in my life when I was basically the only thing I was good or good at was laying around, laying around watching Netflix and shooting dope. And so I remember taking a look in the mirror. I'm eight months sober at the time. And I just, I hated who I saw. It didn't matter how sober I was. I did not like who I saw in the mirror. There wasn't me. There wasn't a me I wanted to be. And so I had found out about a little running group I had heard of that met in downtown Austin. And I was never a runner growing up. If I was running without a basketball or a football in my hand, I was in trouble for something. It was punishment. But I was like, I, right, you know, I'll lose a couple of pounds. Let me go see what's up. And so I went to downtown Austin and there was like 20 or 30 men or women there. And they're all stretching and, you know, doing their leg swings and all that, getting ready. And I, I show up and my ego's, my ego's this big. And I'm like, oh, they don't got nothing for me. And I did, I hadn't run in, I hadn't run in forever. And so we ran two miles that day. I thought I was going to nearly die. I was absolutely dead last in the run, but I got done and 
you know, I just remember feeling this overwhelming sense of accomplishment that I hadn't felt in the longest time. And so I went back, back, back to the treatment center and I made the decision. I was like, anytime they're meeting, I'm going to run with them. And so every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I would go, I would go run. And pretty quickly, I'd heard about this woman named Penny and I heard she runs these things called ultra marathons. And I didn't, I had no idea what that was. And so then I'd heard it's, you know, it's on trails and all that. And I'd been doing mostly road running and I love the effect of what running was giving me, you know, the, the mental health benefits, the, the physical benefits I was getting. But anytime you can add a layer of crazy into it, and now we're talking about going out mm-hmm. on trails and all that, I was like, all right, cool, I'm in. So I met her and I begged her, if she, asked her if she'd train me up for a race. She said, absolutely. And so within no time, she had got me out on the trails and started training me, you know, teaching me how to run downhill full speed, teaching me how to pace myself all these things. Cause I started running. I was an addict. I just thought I needed to run hard all the time. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to get too long winded, but one thing I do want to say is, you know, I, I look back at, at all the times I'd went to treatment and all the times I'd went and talked to doctors or health professionals and, and tried to talk about, you know, when, when I got out of the military, they diagnosed me with, you know, depress- PTSD, depression, anxiety disorder, panic disorder, agoraphobia, sleep disorder, nightmares, you name it. And just this laundry list of, of, of ailments. And I just remember them like sliding 12 bottles of pills through the window at me. And that was the answer. And so I looked and, you know, I had tried, I had tried doing that at first, you know, this is, this is back when I was in the domiciliary and I tried taking the medications, but at the end of the day, it didn't make, didn't, didn't make me happy. It didn't keep me sober. It wasn't the fix for me not saying people shouldn't take medications. This just wasn't the answer for me. And so I did that, you know, that was me trying to address my mental health. And then I went and I got in the program and tried to address my spiritual health. And the one thing I had found for myself is, is every, the recovery, I got trapped in like a recovery bubble where recovery became my world, my existence. So every, everything, everything I did, everybody I talked to, every event I went to was just all recovery, recovery, recovery. And what nobody ever talked to me about or what I never knew about was like using that as a foundation and getting back to living a life, right? Discovering, yes. discovering something that actually lit a fire up under my butt that makes me want to be alive, makes me want to be sober. And so I discovered this running thing. And me personally, I had never put any correlation to how running or how fitness could impact my recovery. But, you know, up to this point, I thought it was just medications and, and this and that was the only thing that was, that was going to help my mental health. But now I start going on these runs and I'm around these amazing people and I, I'm actually comfortable being out in public around people with this agoraphobia thing. And my my depression starts getting less and less. My anxiety starts subsiding and I just start having all these mental health benefits that I'd never had anything else. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to keep doing it. And so then I start realizing how the fitness thing connected to my mental health, my spiritual health, and it completely transformed my entire experience and treatment. And the more I got into running, the more better things started to happen to me. And so, yeah, it was just, it completely transformed my entire experience. I think like the imagery that's coming up for me as you're talking about it is almost like this triangle sort of thing. And and you have... Yeah. Like I, I would say the, the one feeds into the other, which feeds into the other, which feeds into the other sort of thing. Right. So you have the, the mental, the physical and the spiritual and the spiritual only benefits through the physical, mm-hmm. the psychological only benefits through the physical and vice versa too. Right. Like they, they can, like the more, the more psychologically balanced you are, the more psychologically resilient you are to be willing to take on challenges, the better your physical is going to be too, because that's going to feed into that branch as well. Yep. But yeah, but it seems like they, they all flow together. And I think with the, in big, bold letters, disclaimer here saying, if you're on medication, Kenny or Sean is not telling you to stop taking your medication. Right. But I resonate with that totally, right? Like the mental health improved so much, despite the fact that like, by the time I started doing my physical health, I was sober for, I don't know, six years. I had done a ton of therapy. I was in school to be a therapist. So I, I had done a lot of work, 
but still there was something and I'm 250, I'm 90 pounds overweight and, and, and I, and I feel miserable. And I know that, like, I know what the problem is. I know I'm overweight and I feel miserable and, and sad that I'm overweight and, and have this belief that that's never going to change because this is just kind of who I am now. This is what I am. And, and so like from an obvious perspective, if I took care of myself physically, then it would improve these other things somewhat. Yep. I had no idea how much it would though. I had no idea how significant it played a role in there. Right. Yeah. I, could, I couldn't even have dreamt. Yeah. So you meet Penny and Penny takes you on this journey into the ultra scene, which is the running world is already a weird world. It's like so weird. And, but then the ultra scene is like, is like the weirdest people on the planet, just the most accepting and positive people out there. And so she takes you and throws you into this world. And here you are an agoraphobic quote unquote, going into this weird scene. So how was that for you in this, this, this place where I'm sure you were accepted with open arms and, and embraced in, in really weird ways. Yeah. The, it's funny. I, the best way I can describe the, to people, the, the difference between road running and, and, and all trail running is for whatever reason, to me, the, the vibe I got with road runners, I can remember running the Austin marathon for the first time. And by this time I had already run ultras. So I knew what the trail running was like. And so I run the Austin marathon and everybody's like super serious. Nobody's talking. The race starts and just everybody's just running. Nobody's looking. Nobody's talking to anybody. Ultra marathon. We're running double, triple the distance. And people are chatting, laughing. The most you pass somebody, the person you just passed is telling you great job. And so mm-hmm. that community of accepting people was exactly what I needed. I just didn't know it. Um, you know, with road runners, I feel like if you fall down in a marathon, you know, you can fall and break your leg, you break your ankle and somebody's going to be step over you and they're going to be mad. You messed up their pace time. Fell running. You could just slip on a route and there'll be four people there ready to catch you and give up their entire race. And so immediately I was like, all right, these are my people. They didn't care. I was tatted. They didn't care. I was a felon. All they cared about was I'm showing up and I'm doing crazy long runs with them. And so, you know, thank God my, my friend Penny saved my life because we started running and she trained me up for a 10 K. And so we go out, we do a 10K, and I was I was feeling myself afterward. I felt so good, so accomplished. I'm like, ooh, look at me. Just did a 10K. Heroin addict, look at me. And when I got done, she looked at me and just kind of shrugged her shoulders. And she was like, yeah, that was all right. You could do more. And I was like, well, what do you mean I could do more? She's like, you could do longer. And I was like, all right, then I'll do longer. And so my next race was a 30K. And she just knew how to poke me. She knew how to get me competitively. And so I did the 30K. She did the same thing. Then it was a 50K, then it was a 100K, and it kept going. But I did a 100K in my first, within my first year of sobriety, and that was so big for me because I looked around and was like, I'm capable of far more than I had ever given myself credit for. Here I'm a year removed from shooting heroin, just getting out of prison, you know, leading a crazy lifestyle around crazy people. And now I just came out to Bandera, Texas, and ran 62 miles and qualified myself for for Western States somehow. And so I was just, I was all in. And so, you know, my, I just, I can't say it enough for, I don't care if anybody's run trails or ultra marathons, you know, there's not everybody's out there sprinting. There's people hiking it. There's people, you know, walking, but I don't care. I went out to my last one with a rucksack on and nobody looked at me twice. No, no. <laughs> it's like, there's a guy with a rucksack. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and it's just all those, all those type of people, man. And they're just, they'll smile, they'll help you and everything. And so it was just, she introduced me to the greatest group of human beings I could ever hope to hope to be around. And it just, it was the best. It was the first time I look back on my journey and, you know, there was really nothing different. I've been, uh, high dollar treatment centers, mid-tier treatment centers, state-funded treatment centers. I was able to get sober at a state-funded treatment center, implemented some running in my life, had an amazing community of people. But what I had noticed is this was the first time that I had left treatment and had like this amazing foundation already waiting for me. I already had some purpose. I already had something I was excited about. I had found something in my life that had become far more important than any drug I could do. And so I used to get a lot of people, especially within the recovery community that would look at me and they're like, well, 
you know what you're doing. You're just replacing one addiction for another. And I hear you. I get what you're saying. But if you're going to tell me that this thing that I've discovered in my life that has put complete structure back into my life, discipline into my life, it makes me go to bed early. It makes me wake up early. It makes me eat healthy. It makes me drink water. And it's put me around the greatest group of people I've ever met in my entire life. It makes me wake up every morning excited to be alive, excited to be sober. If you're going to tell me that this thing that I discovered is bad and you're going to try to make it into something that's not good, I don't know if we can continue to have this conversation because it has absolutely transformed my life. And so, yeah, like I, it was it was the best medicine a doctor had never prescribed to me. I just wanted to take a quick pause and genuinely thank you for getting this far through the episode. This podcast is very small if you haven't noticed. So every like, every comment, every follow or subscribe, it really makes a difference. So my only request from you is to interact with the content if you like it. Like and follow, rate and review, and share if you feel like this is something that's worthy of sharing. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's a, that's a great way of putting it. So I had a conversation with Brooke Wright. We did a podcast episode, several podcasts back, and she had brought something up. So Brooke is the wife of Chad Wright, who's uh, popular within the ultra scene, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And, and very inspirational dude content someday that I would love to have him on this show, but, but uh, yeah, Brooke came on and she, she's a recovering addict. And she had mentioned how for her early in sobriety, she jumped right into the physical thing, physical exercise thing. And it really helped her really significantly helped her. And recently she had a back injury, Mm -hmm. a a significant injury. And it it put all exercise out on the, the back burner and it really impacted her mental health because so much like her, her medicine was exercise. And she's like, I, I never learned a why a wider range of coping skills other than exercise. I put all my eggs into one basket and then I didn't have these other coping skills when that one was gone, when that basket was done, no more eggs. Right. Mm-hmm. So do you want to speak to that a little bit? Cause I feel like I've, I've never heard anybody with years of sobriety who have exercise in their life, give me that side of things. I, I was kind of shocked by it. Do, do you want to talk about your thoughts on it? No, that's, I, I agree a hundred percent. There was a, after I had finished the, uh, you know, spoiler for the documentary, but after I had done the hundred miler, I went through like a, a low point mentally for whatever reason. And, you know, I'm definitely not a scientist. I've read up on it. Some people have talked about, you know, you you, you do something that extreme with your body that you're not used to. And you, you basically yeah. spend, spend your brain of all serotonin, dopamine, all those feel good things. And so I was like back being depressed. And so I had been asked before, like, you know, what if, what if you get injured? What if you can't run anymore? And that was like a very real thing. I was like, Oh man, I didn't think of that. What if I do, what if I do lose running? But the, the one thing that's remained constant in this entire journey of mine as far as sobriety goes is is helping people i definitely i've had enough lessons in life where i knew that that was that was money for me i I needed to get outside of self and start helping people and so it started when i was in treatment and running actually taught me that because i would come back to the i would come back to the treatment center after doing my runs in the morning and you know, I'd, I'd get back, my room would be made, I'd, I'd take a shower, and I'd be like ready to go for the day. I'm down in the courtyard, I'm firing on all cylinders, my brain's going, and I'm like ready for the day. And here I feel good, you know, I'm starting to look good, everything is, everything's clicking, and everybody else in that treatment center would just be waking up, and they'd be shuffling down the stairs to come get breakfast, wiping sleepers out of their eyes, and here I am on level 10, I'm like, what's up, good morning, and People would look at me crazy, but they would sit back and watch the impact that running was having on me, the transformation I was a part of. And so it was the first time ever in life for sobriety that people wanted some of what I had. And so I started having all Mm -hmm. these other, all these other addicts and alcoholics in treatment come up to me and start asking me about running. And, you know, they were at least every night that I would be getting ready to go for a run the next day, I would get three or four people and be like, Hey man, what time you leave in the morning? All right, I'm going to be up. I'll be, I'll be ready to go. 
And so I'd leave there at like 445. Out of those four people, I'd be lucky if there'd be one, but if there was one, then awesome. So <laughs> one by one, I got one person and then I got three people and then I got seven people. And at one point I had all 16 of the people that were in treatment with me walk into downtown Austin to go run with me. And so that was my mm. first taste of being able to kind of use my experience to help others. And that's what started feeding my spirit. When I talk about how running affected my mental health and my spirituality, that's how it affected my spirit because that was the first lesson that I was like, okay, I can use some of this experience what I have and use it to help people. And so that was also just as important that the running was something that I kept doing. When I got out of there, I started mentoring at-risk youth and my life literally became about how can I use all this all this pain and all this trauma and all this, you know, bad stuff I've done and been through and how can I use it to help people? And so, you know, even going back to what we're talking about with, you know, my buddy Corey that passed away, it's like everything I do, I'm going to make that dude proud. And so this is how I'm going to do it. And so that if, had I not learned that lesson, life could have been very different. I could have lost running and I could have went right back to where I was, but even in that low time of me after the hundred miler or through injuries and stuff like that, the one constant has always been to help people. It's what I do to this day. It's why I do a podcast. It's why I speak. It's why I do everything. And it's, uh, it's not failed me yet. It's called different things, but post-race blues is probably the thing I hear mostly it, it called post-race blues which is very similar to that of postpartum depression for, for mm -hmm. women, right? Because neurologically, physically, it's different what's happening, obviously, right? But um, neurologically, it's very similar. What's, you know, the, the high boost of dopamine, serotonin, everything that your body goes through from a neurological standpoint to push it to the extreme that it has to push it through. And then not to mention the months and months and months of preparation that you put in beforehand and then to get to that point and then it's over. And, and so the, one of the better ways of dealing with that is always having the next, mm -hmm. you know, what's the next thing that you can do right. um, for the post-race blues particularly. But, but yeah, that's, uh, that's great insight. So service that, and that's a common thread, man, like between addiction and normies mm -hmm. is service. Yeah, like there is no more of a common thread that people try to pull on to try to help themselves um, be a value or to feel like they have value and purpose in, in life than to pull on that thread of service, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. So from a, from a physical exercise standpoint, now it's clear, this is medicinal for you. It really, really helps. And from according to the Instagram, you're, you're doing a lot of lifting. Are, are you still doing running now or like, how, are you integrating the two? How's that going? Just, just getting back into running. I don't okay. know. I don't know if I have any ultras on the horizon or anything like that. Mainly it's just cardio right now, but it was a, there was a point there. I had done so much running and, you know, in those years, those first years of sobriety and everything and continue to do ultras afterwards. And the worst the worst thing that could ever have happened to me probably was the fact that I became good at running. And so mm -hmm. as I was training for the hundred mile, hundred mile, you know, I'm running 80, 90, hundred miles a week, depending on the week. And I was just best shape of my life as far as cardio wise. And so a lot of the practice races that I was starting to, to run, to build up to the hundred, you know, I, I won a marathon. I got fourth in a 50, won a 50 K, won a 30 K. And so, now, all of a sudden, this thing in my life that was so therapeutic and everything has now taken on this other form to where now I'm good. Now I want to win. And so now I got a taste of that. Mm -hmm. So now every race, I have it in my head. I need to win or place. And so after the 100 miler, you know, that only that only continued to get more and more of a feeling. And so then it became this thing where I go run 100K and if I didn't place or win, now I feel like I failed. But I'm not looking at the fact of most, you know, most runners will never even run a hundred K, let alone just regular people. And so I couldn't be happy with that. And so mm -hmm. there was a, there was a time where I was, I was training for, I was trying to go to, trying to go to Western States. And so I was trying to get the best time I could at this Bandera hundred K. And I, I wanted to try to go for the golden ticket. If you win, if you win that race, you get a golden ticket right into Western States. And so I really wanted to try for that. And so I was using a training race to build up to that. And this training race did not matter. It was just a 50 K and 
here i'm halfway through the race and i find myself battling for first place with this other guy and at one point he kind of pulled off to, to pee and as soon as he as soon as he pulled off and did that i was like oh i got him there's no way he's ever going to catch me now but right around the same time i had noticed i had something bothering my foot and so here it, I, I had a nerve in my foot that was starting to get inflamed but i didn't stop and come to find out i was wearing too too aggressive of trail shoes for the type of terrain that i was on and by the time i was done done with the race i, I came across the line i won the race i had to take my shoe off immediately and i couldn't even really walk to the car i mm. i had damaged his nerves so bad so for five months i did not run one step anytime i would go get ready to start to it inflame immediately so i just had to give it time so mm. That was around that time where it was like, I, you know, I can't run right now. What else can I do? And so I started piddling around in the gym a little bit. But in all honesty, I would only really go in and do cardio stuff. I was afraid to get on the weights because, and I, you know, I'm, I'm a trainer now, so I work with clients daily. And what I see for myself back then, I see every day in the gym now. And what keeps people away from the gym in most cases is the fact people don't want to go in there and feel like they look dumb. They don't want to feel like they look stupid, like they don't know what they're doing. And that was me to a T. And so I don't run for five months. And a buddy of mine called me and started begging me to run a 50K with him. He wanted to run his first ultra. And so he was a road runner and he was all excited about doing an ultra marathon. I joked with him. I told him 50Ks don't really count. But yeah, <laughs> but I, I told him, I was like, all right, man, I'll run it with you. I know I can finish it, but I, you know, who knows how I'm going to do. If you need to leave me, go ahead and leave me. And so we, we set out on this 50 K and it's deep in the hill country. It's pretty, pretty tough track. We were running and everything and probably first two miles into the race, he ends up dropping because he had rolled his ankle so many times. he had only, yeah. he had only been practicing on roads. And I kept telling him, I was like, bro, you got to run trails. Your ankles aren't going to be ready. And so he ends yeah. up dropping. So now I'm out here in this race. And so I end up start to feel pretty good. And I end up winning this 50 K after not running for five months. And so I got done and I just remember I had this sense of like, I don't know, I kind of just feel like I want, I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish with this sport as a whole. Not that the race wasn't hard, not that it's not hard every time. I just kind of feel like I had done what I wanted to do. And so I didn't have that same amount of inspiration I did when I started. And so funny enough, I go home that night and the girl I was dating broke up with me through text. And so I go to, I go to bed completely heartbroken that night. And I remember looking up at the ceiling and I was like, next time I see her, I'm going to be jacked. And I woke mm -hmm. up the next morning and started going to the gym and I've never looked back. Um, still never have come across the girl, but thank God that <laughs> happened. If I ever did see her, I would thank her because that's probably one of the most important things to happen because that gave me that last little nudge I needed to get into the gym. And it's, again, it's transformed me into another, com you know, completely other person and, so now I have this good balance and, you know, now I have this understanding of like running was a tool. Running those races was a tool for me. The gym is a tool. It's not the end all be all, but the gym definitely inspires me currently in a way that running, running doesn't, but I don't like, I see some of my, run, some of my running friends and they like giving me some shit. So, you know, I dip my toe back in every once in a while, but just trying to keep a healthy balance with it all. See what happens. Mm -hmm. Our art. Are 200s, 250s not appealing to you? Is is this not like firing something like this competitive sort of bug inside of you being like, well, I don't know. Like, I haven't done that yet. I ran a 100K at Lake Tahoe after my 100 miler and they were, they were doing the Bigfoot 200. And mm -hmm. my whole thing with ultra running was I wanted to see how long I could run for. I know. And one of my big secrets of my training was I would run hills all the time. Like I would, I would find the biggest hills and just run hill repeats all the time. And so for a lot of these races where, where, where a lot of ultra runners will power hike hills, I never did that. I could still maintain a run. I wasn't sprinting, but I was running. And then I also discovered it's a good way to kind of mess with people mentally. You know, when you're deep into a race and everybody's dying and tired and they're power hiking a hill and I look fresh and I come trotting up the hill right behind you it just it messes people would fall apart and so i'd always kept that and so i noticed when i was running the tahoe 100k most of the people that were running or doing the 200 were, were power hiking the whole thing and so that's kind of where it was like all right it's 
you know, don't get me wrong. I know there's elite runners out there that are running all 200 milers, but I was just like, ah, like, you know, I ran, for, I ran the hundred, like I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm happy. Okay. And then another, yeah. another, another thing and the, the other better way I can describe a why, why the gym over running is running in many ways got me back to being me. I felt like everybody, when I got sober, I felt like the whole world operated here and I operated right here. It was like, I was just dumbed down. I was dull. I wasn't sharp. I wasn't witty. Like I normally am any of those things. And I got involved with the running and it built me back up to where like I needed to be. Um, but I will say running got me back to who I was being supposed to be, but the gym, the gym gave me confidence. I didn't have before, you know, there's a definite difference. You know, when, when, when you're having in the gym and you walk into a room, people notice you grab people's attention. And so just as far as a speaker or standing up in front of people, the gym just put a confidence into my life that I didn't get from running. Not it just, it's just different. There is an amount of confidence in knowing I can go out and run a hundred miles right now, but there's a whole different confidence that comes with, you know, physical appearance and all that. And so I just think they accent each other perfectly. And the, the gym was what I needed at that point in time in my life. And so that's kind of the way I was able to, to balance it out. If that makes sense. Yeah. I like to ask this question to any, any guest that I have, who's an addict. Because oftentimes I get different answers. So I'll ask you, and I asked you this before, so, but I'll ask it again because this time we're going to get it recorded. <laughs> what is addiction? Did you ask me this before? That's a good question. <laughs> um, it's a hard question. To me, to me or to what the industry says? To you. Yeah. Addiction, addiction is just the inability to, you know, the inability to stop an action or, uh, you know, an act, um, even when you don't want to do it to me. Okay. All right. And what is sobriety? To have power over the decision of whether, whether I am or I am not going to do that thing that I couldn't stop before. There's a, a quick story I'll tell you that kind of might paint a better picture for what I just said. And so where, when I where I went to treatment, a lot of veterans end up going through there. Most of the people that go through the state funding facility were homeless, you know, fresh off the street. And so my, you know, my story got out there and, you know, definitely everybody that worked in my treatment center knew who I was. I've been back there a hundred times to, to speak and show the film and all that. So everybody knew who I was. And I had become good friends with the director there. And we still remain great friends to this day and work with each other anytime we could. But at one point there was somebody that was new that started there. And I think they were in charge of, um, um, they were an alumni coordinator or something like that. And so they had reached out and there was somebody from the, somebody at the state Capitol in Texas here in Austin wanted somebody to come represent as far as mental health and addiction goes. And so my name got brought up. And so this guy called me and he didn't know me. And so he starts talking to me and telling me what all this would entail. And was I interested? And I was like, yeah, anything I could do to help. And so he goes, all right, I just have a couple quick questions. Let me ask those. And, you know, we'll get you, we'll get you hooked up. And so he starts on this little questionnaire. And one of the first questions was, do you, are you currently suffering from, you know, mental health or addiction? And I said, no. And he goes, he stops and he goes, well, what do you mean? No, I'm, I'm not currently suffering from any of those things. And he goes, what do you mean? You said you're an addict, right? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And he goes, well, and then he starts on the whole, your, your addictions around the corner. It's doing push-ups. Your relapse could happen at any time. Da, 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 da. And I was, I was like, man, you asked me if I was currently suffering from mental health or addiction. I'm not currently suffering from anything. He's like, but you're an addict. And he wanted to like go back and forth with me on this, you know, this topic. And I was like, man, look, I'm not going to give you the answer you want to this question because if I did, then that would suggest that I'm just over here white knuckling it through life that I can't, I, I can't manage the decision of if I'm going to wake up and get high or drunk tomorrow. And that's not the case. Like I've recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. I don't, I don't suffer from, or I don't wake up wondering if I'm going to get high or drunk that day. So I'm not going to say that to you. And so that's just kind of how to me, you know what I mean? I can rationalize the addiction sobriety thing in, in, in my mind. Yes, I'm yes, I'm an addict. Yeah. I'll always be an addict, but I don't currently suffer from everything. 
yeah, I think that's a myth that that is often portrayed is and I think it's it's disheartening to people who are trying to get sober. Like I think the people are trying to say it, it's like this humble brag. It's like, man, I I suffer day in and day out with this disease. And you know, it was like this this sort of machismo that comes with this thing that you have to suffer with on a daily basis. And and when I'm working with clients that are trying to get sober and they hear that often, they hear it in media, they hear it on TV shows, they hear it in uh, some, somebody who has 30 years of sober and they're telling them, man, it's been a grunt 30 years, been, you know, every day, every day. It's like, I don't know. Like I haven't been sober 30 years. I've been sober 17 years, but like somewhere around after three there was literally no effort put into specifically trying to stay off of substances, off of mind altering substances. Right now. And, and, and it's not even saying every day for three years, it was an effort, but there'd be times where it'd pop into my head and be like, man, yeah, that, that'd be good. That, that'd be nice here and there. Now, but somewhere around the year, three year mark that just left. And I had this thought of even if I could use and get away with it without having negative consequences, I still want it. I right. still want it. And and that happened around three year mark for me. But so that's one of these myths that I think are portrayed, or maybe it's not a myth for a lot of people. And that's unfortunate for them. If you can have years of sobriety and it's still to be a struggle for you, right? that sucks for you. And you're probably not doing what you just mentioned or what you started off saying is using 12 steps as a foundation to branch off into other areas of life. But, but yeah, so I think that's one of the myths that, that come up often. And that was going to be one of the things I was going to ask you is just myths around the sobriety world and things like that. So anything else that comes up for you in terms of maybe pet peeves or things that people say in the sobriety world that just drive you crazy? I mean, just all the, I think, you know, number one, that, you know, what, what we're talking about, I can remember. I'd say number one, that, and then number two, all the, all the cliches, you know, I, I don't, I'll be quite honest. I don't go to, I don't go to meetings like I used to, but you know, I, maybe, I don't know if it's times have changed. People have changed. Meetings have changed. Maybe I've changed my thought process. I don't know. I've changed, but you know, I, I can't sit in a room where, let me, let me go back. AA 12 steps saved my life. I'm, I'm not slighting it at all, but it's very different when you go sit around, sit around in a room and, you know, there's, there's meetings where there's people talking about like real life shit and you don't hear them throwing out cliches and quoting the big book and all that there, they can relate it too, but that's not, they're not using the words mm -hmm. from the book all the time. And then you go to these other meetings where it's just a bunch of people regurgitating stuff out of the book and giving what it like, how it applies or anything like that, but they're not saying anything. You can read sentences out of a book, but you mm -hmm. still can't tell me what that means. And so, and if you go in there and you try to talk about some real life stuff, you know, it's like, stay on topic, stay on topic. Mm -hmm. So that, that's just kind of like, what? Like, it just doesn't, it doesn't make so much sense to me. And so I'm saying all that to say, like, I sat down in the rooms for the first time and just kind of looked around and I was like, this is it. Like, I have to do this forever just for the rest of my life. And so not saying the program's not helpful, but my outlook, and I think a lot of people's outlook isn't hopeful when you feel that I need to be tethered to this for the rest of my life. There's nobody, anybody that's still in meetings that's 20, 30 years sober, they're obviously going there all the time. And so they have that messaging of like, oh, it's the daily grind, like addictions around the corner doing push-ups, And it's like, if you're at 30 years, five years, 10 years, anything like that, and that's still the case for you, in my opinion, there's, you're not doing something right. You miss the part where it's like, we do this to get back to living a life. This is not life now. And so that's my biggest thing. And I don't like how, you know, I, I talk all the time on my podcast, long form about these type of ideas and stuff like that. And I don't want people to think I'm anti 12 step at all. What I hope is that people understand that this is a foundation for you. This is not your world. This is not your life, but it's on you to find something that lights a fire up under your ass. Let this get you to where you need to be, but it's on you to go out here in the world now and try to discover something that becomes more important to you than getting high or getting drunk. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Okay. So same question about the exercise world. Pet Ooh. peeves or myths that, that come up that are said all the time and just drive you crazy. Oh, there's so many. This one I'll go. Mm -hmm. The big one... The one I get most commonly, you know, when I'm talking with 
so what I'll do now is primarily all the people that I work with fitness wise are in the, they're in the recovery, they're in the recovery world. So I do treatment center groups and then I'll work with individual clients. I do this for a couple of different treatment centers and without a doubt, whenever I'm talking about a client who wants to sign up with me, they'll immediately be like, well, I'm not, I'm not trying to get all big and bulky like you. And I'm like, well, that it doesn't just happen. I promise you don't just come in here and strip over weights and that happen. And I got to explain it's more how you eat. I'll get a lot of people that tell me that, you know, bro, I was big like you just when I was in high school. I was like, okay, I bet. But the other thing is like, I'm really just trying to tone up. So I just want to do lightweight, high reps. And I was like, that's, that's not a thing. There's no science to that. It's it's more in how you eat. We just got to get under the fat for you to have that toned muscle. And so it's just little and funny stuff like that. I'd say one of my pet peeves is now the, you know, the, the social media, social media where we live in or some gyms you walk into where it's just a bunch of, a bunch of people with tripods and, you know, doing TikTok <laughs> dances and all that. I don't get down with all that. Like I'm there to, I'm, I'll chat with people and have a smile on my face, but I'm not trying to, you're not going to get mad at me for walking in line on your phone or knocking over your tripod or some shit. I, I don't, I don't. My my gym is this right here is where I'm at right now. This is a shipping container that's on my property. So I, I roll out of bed, put clothes on, brew a cup of coffee and walk out here to the gym every morning. That's my, that's my routine. But um, so I don't have to deal with the, deal with the cliche 19 year old taking up a machine for 15 minutes while they're sitting there on their phone, scanning their phone or taking a video of themselves doing an exercise on the machine for 15 minutes. But yeah, I, I can't imagine the the one that drives me crazy. And it, it's because it's what I believed for the longest time. And I believed it because I was never told I was wrong. And then I had doctors like help solidify it too, was knee pain, right? Like you have bad knees, so don't run. Mm-hmm. So if you have bad knees, don't run taking a ridiculous amount of Motrin in the military for knees, you know, bad knees, bad knees. And, and sure enough, when I would run, I would go and and go and run for a mile or two knee pain, you know, like it'd be, it'd be bad knee pain, awful. And then, you know, do a plyometric workout knee pain, but a little bit less weirdly enough, but, but knee pain nonetheless. And I started running two years ago, roughly. And it went from running zero miles, like only lifting and doing yoga to then deciding, okay, I'm going to do a marathon. So when I went, I did the, did the marathon, like, yeah, from mile three on, it was like ungodly knee pain. It was like really bad knee pain. And then after I did that marathon, it shook my whole worldview on what resilience was in my own personal story. And then I had to do another one. So I I was thinking, okay, what's the next thing I'm going to do? But I decided to train for that next one. Otherwise, my wife wouldn't let me do it. And so I'm training for the next one. And yeah, knee pain is there. Knee pain is there. Knee pain is there. Three months goes by. Knee pain is starting to go away. Why is my knee? I don't have knee pain. What's going on in the knee pain? is? <laughs> and so like now, so knee pain, I have, I have knee pain, but it's like, it's not near what it was. Right. Like, what does that tell me? That the knees got stronger. They mm-hmm. got better by exercising them. Yeah. You know, the, it wasn't, it wasn't the avoidance of the exercise that helped them. It was the avoidance of exercise that made them worse. Right. I'll give, I'll give you two more really quick. People that you don't, you don't need to take pre-workout every single day. It's worthless. Stop doing it. It just, it's just like, that, dr- just like drugs. You that's become a become immune to it. Okay. So you're saying that's a myth. You don't, you, or don't do it because the myth is you should do it. Well, no, everybody. You, So everybody, it's usually somebody discovers the gym. First thing they want to run out and do is buy all the supplements because they think that's the key. Once you do it for a while, you realize you need a good multivitamin, some some fish oil, drink your water, maybe a little something for blood flow. You're good to go. All that other shit, you know what I mean? Protein powder, you don't need it. Eat real food. Pre-workout, you don't need it. These people that take pre-workout, they'll wake up, they'll drink coffee, they'll crush pre-workout, they'll get some crazy strong pre-workout. They don't understand what they're doing to their, you know what I mean, their their adrenal system, their central nervous system, all that. Like you're just taxing the shit out of that every day. Use it as a tool just like everything else. If there's a day you're feeling a little sluggish, if there's a day you want to go super hard for a workout and hit a PR, cool, use it. But you don't need that shit mm-hmm. day. You're just wasting your money and you're immune to it anyways. You take it every day. And then Within the recovery world, you know, we're addicts. So everybody wants to, everybody wants to find the quickest, 
quickest way to get to the destination. And so, you know, almost routinely I'll get guys that will start talking to me and they'll be like, oh, man, I got low testosterone. I got this. And then, you know, they want to hop out and then they get on trend and all these other steroids. And I'm like, I have to sit there and explain to them where it's like, dude, look, you look at all these body voters or people on Instagram and YouTube and, and what you're what you're failing to realize is these a lot of these people that are the top of the top, they're elite, like they lifted for five or 10 years. They got every ounce of muscle they could out of their body. Then they had to introduce that stuff because their body wouldn't carry around any more muscle. So they had to do that. You're jumping. You have no muscle on your frame. You have no big <laughs> and you're going to get out of treatment. And because you've been lifting for two weeks while you're in treatment, that you feel like you need to go get on testosterone and tread where it's like, you don't even know how to work out yet. You don't know how to rest. You don't know how to eat. You don't know how to do anything. Now you're putting on all this. You're changing the physio physiology of your body, putting hormones into your body. You lift and you might look decent, okay, for those couple, you know month or two that you're on it, but you don't keep any of that when you get off. You go right back to where you were. Mm -hmm. so you're, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your money. Those are the a lot of the conversations and a lot of the pet peeves I have with some of these guys. Well, I could see that too, because you're still, I mean, you're still such an addict that early and you're still the, the mentality of quick fix and, and trying to find the shortcut, trying to push the cheat codes is so heavy at that point. So yeah, I, I could see how that can happen. Well, that, 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 sure. that's how we know we're addicts for sure, because there's professional bodybuilders who lit literally make a living off this stuff. And they'll sit there and tell you, they're like, I would never put trend into my body. Trend is a steroid for anybody yeah. that doesn't know, but it's like the the strongest, most toxic steroid there is. But us mm -hmm. dope addicts hear that. Like, we're the same people that we heard the dope up the <laughs> Well, that's the dope that I need to put in my body. So yeah. it's like, well, what's the best steroid trend? I'm in. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You're, so you're telling me not to do it because it's too good? Okay. Wait a minute. Wait, that doesn't make sense. I'm going to definitely do it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, man. Well, uh, I, I think that's a good place to end. Um, uh, I, well, I, I hesitate with asking you, um, this question because, you know, on your last episode, um, I, I thought I was so witty on within our last episode to ask you this question to end off on because it's how you end all of your episodes. And then, um, I can't, is it Rachel, the young lady who, who did your, who interviewed yeah. you for the last podcast episode of yours? And then she goes and she, and well, it, she was supposed to ask that question, right? She had to, because it's, that's your show's thing. But, and then she got the answers out of you. And now I feel weird for asking you. So, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Okay. All right. So your show ends with an, I am statement. Right. I am blank. So you feel free to answer the question, Sean. Right. I am blank. So do you want one or do you want a couple? You bring it all, all of it. All right. So the, the, the way I just, just to let everybody know that when we end our podcast, people come on, they tell their whole story, but you get to know about the person. You don't truly really know who the person is. And so there's a lot of, a lot of what I do is, you know, the podcast is I am redemption. Redemption is not, I'm not just saying that about me, anybody, it could be any be anybody or anything, but I would say that I am statements that, that best define me today are I'm humbled for the experience of ever even being asked to come on and share on a podcast. I've never thought anything I had to say was that important, but for somebody else to, to see that and ask me to come on, I'm humbled every time. I'm lucky, I'm very lucky for where I'm at today. Lucky to have the people that I have in my life and the opportunities that I do. And I'll say I'm resilient. I don't know when to quit. I just keep going. Good things happen. Right on, man. All right. Well, thanks for coming on the Patina Podcast, dude. And yeah, the resilience speaks to doing this, well, being willing to do this three times. So really appreciate it, dude. Thank you so much for coming on. Nah, brother, it was my pleasure, dude. Anything you ever need, let me know, man. Any way I can ever help you. Good luck to you and everything you're doing. It was an absolute pleasure to come on. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Patina Podcast. There are other shows that emphasize resilience, but my intent is to normalize personal development through embracing challenge by interviewing the common man and woman, the person that you and I can relate to. If you are someone who wants to soak up the insights of normal people doing extraordinary things, please subscribe. If you know somebody who is overwhelmed by fear and complacency, please share this podcast with 
I'm your host, Kenny Hill, and I run a private practice near Sacramento, California called Recovery Hill. My website is in the description tab along with my social media links. The intro music was Two in the Back, performed by Sunday at Slams on Blue Dot Sessions. <laughs>